buenos días a todos a ustedes. Un saludo especial a nuestros amigos chilenos y muchas gracias por la bienvenida acá en Calera de la Presidente de la República, Michelle Bachelet. Thanks to friend Natasha for bringing me along with you. Also. And uh, thanks to Luis and ATTA for uh, inviting me to share some thoughts uh, with you today about uh, instigating a revolution for good, instigating revolution for good from a diplomatic perspective. Now, I'm an outsider here. I'm not an expert on tourism, so I apologize in advance for mistakes I make about uh, your industry. But I'm here because we really have so much in common. I mean, this is a room full of ambassadors. Ambassadors for your companies, for your industries, who go into new countries, figure things out, establish new relationships, and get the business done. Now, diplomacy is really about making connections. It's about making connections and building bridges. In my experience as a Canadian diplomat, often working in uh, troubled or conflict-affected areas, you know, we can always find a way to make a connection, no matter how wide the cultural gulf may, uh, may be. Uh, you know, and uh, one, uh, one time before uh, I had my job, I was uh, doing ethnographic work in the highlands of Guatemala, and I was uh, going to San Pedro, a remote village in the western highlands, and I had to walk there and then sleep overnight uh, on the pass, and I uh, was walking along, and uh, I met a farmer, and uh, he looked at me, and he said, I know your brother. And I said, I don't have a brother. He said, yes. Yes, you do, just like you. Blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> so we always want to make a connection somehow. Well, what's a diplomatic perspective? Uh, in this case, it's about seeking changes in an international system, or seeking changes in the conduct of a country, and doing so through cooperation, dialogue, and new ideas. Shannon and his team chose the topic of revolution for this summit because they believe the ATTA has revolutionary potential. And I think they're right. And I think the moment is right for uh, initiatives from ATTA to, uh, to create change at the international level and for ATTA to take a diplomatic role. And getting to the ideas about uh, this role that I have, I'd like to talk about some of the revolutions that are shaping our world today. You know, and revolutions don't happen without producing reactionaries. And there are always spoilers out there opposing positive change. As responsible global citizens, I think we all need to be aware of the threats and challenges that we face these days, and then consider how we can instigate revolutions for good. And in the case of ATTA, that could mean revolutions across the supply chain, that uh, you have and across your stakeholder base. And on the way to these destinations of ideas for ATTA revolutions, uh, I want to talk about the revolution in the diamond industry, as uh, Luis mentioned, that happened about 10 years ago, and share some diplomatic tips and experiences that might be helpful to ATTA ambassadors on this journey. Why do revolutions happen? Sometimes technology creates revolutionary new possibilities. They happen because people's needs and expectations change. They happen because people's values and ethics change. These are, these things are always changing. And they happen because existing systems can't deliver to standards and new values. And of course, they happen when leaders choose to seize opportunities for change. Now here's a lady with a tough job the UN Chief Negotiator for Climate. She says, I'm very comfortable with the world revolution. In my experience, revolutions have been very positive. So this is a woman who is very optimistic about revolutions. I'd just like to share a thought about what Shimon Perez says about uh, optimism. He said, optimists and pessimists, they die the same way. What's different is the way they live. So let's run by some of the positive revolutions that are shaping our lives today. Revolutions that are in, course, that are in course as we speak. 
No doubt, globalization has brought amazing new freedom for so many people. Freedom to go new places, freedom to know new things, and it's broken down geographic barriers to opportunity for billions of people. Technology revolution, it's turbocharged our personal freedoms. It's a layer on globalization that can bring us closer together. And as this nice African man is showing us, help people have access, in this case banking, to the services we all need for development and prosperity. It may not be happening as fast as Christina Figueres would like, but there's a rapid structural shift in energy markets. Last year, for the first time, uh, economic growth became delinked from growth in emissions, and we can see that if we work hard, if we work together, and we work fast, we can move to a low carbon future. There's a medical revolution that's making it possible to transcend the disabilities of the past and to live longer, active lives. My two grandchildren were born to six great-grandparents, which is a huge intergenerational benefit of the medical revolution. Gay rights, you know, it took a long time, and this revolution is not complete, but we're making great advances in equality for everybody. The progress we see in securing rights and recognizing the rights and protecting the rights for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people is undeniable. Did you know that this is a priority for the human rights program of the United Nations? The gay rights revolution has global momentum, forward direction, and is becoming more solid and mainstream every day. Okay, this is a personal favorite. <laughs> and I guess everybody enjoyed it yesterday. A new kind of music in its time, surprised, delighted, broke down barriers of class and race, uh, broke down inhibitions and challenged authority. Rock and roll ushered in a new and original culture that I think all of us enjoy all over the world. <laughs> well, like Shimon Peres, I'm an optimist. But it's undeniable that we are facing major problems that are new and different from yesterday. We know what they are. Biodiversity loss, refugee crisis, climate change, and wars that just don't seem to ever end. And at the same time, we see reactionary attacks on the gains of globalization, human rights, openness, and equality. These reactionary forces are making our world smaller, more dangerous, and less tolerant. These are forces that create division because they thrive on conflict and prejudice. The Islamic State is in the news and in our heads and affecting uh, our worldview in powerful ways. It's a deeply puzzling movement. Nobody seems to understand it. Nobody really knows what to do, and it's a sad sign of the times. We see the Islamic State and other um, militant movements taking vast spaces and whole cultures out of reach for civilian travel in the southern and eastern Mediterranean and big parts of Africa, too. It was reported this week in the Telegraph that now most British travelers are avoiding Muslim countries. There's pushback on gay rights, most famously in uh, Uganda, where basic rights are still denied and harassment is a continual threat. But this is not only in faraway countries. Gay rights are far from consolidated in North America, as Kim Davis has shown us. You know, it's also very disturbing <laughs> to see reckless, fear-mongering, and prejudice in the heart of a mainstream party in the most powerful democracy in the world. And even rock and roll sometimes has. <laughs> and even rock and roll sometimes has its reactionary enemies. You know, unfortunately, our intergovernmental systems are not keeping pace with the global challenges that we face. Here's what Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations, said to the General Assembly last week. Suffering today is at heights not seen in a generation. 100 million people require immediate humanitarian assistance. At least 60 million people have been forced to flee their homes or their countries 
The United Nations has asked for nearly $20 billion to meet this year's needs, six times the level of a decade ago. Pope Francis went so far as to comment that World War III is emerging. Speaking at the 60th anniversary of World War II, he said, even today, after the second failure of another world war, perhaps one can speak of a third war, one fought piecemeal with crimes, massacres, and destruction. Here we are midway in the second decade of the 21st century, and these difficult, complex, grave problems are simultaneous with globalization, trade liberalization, massive capital flows, and unprecedented flows of travelers. Uh, Elizabeth Becker said that in 2020, there will be 1.5 billion travelers uh, touring the world. Thinking about how these things interact, how they should interact in the context of peace, human rights, and sustainable development has never been more important or more urgent. The takeaway here is that there is no room for complacency in today's world, and in particular, there is no room for waiting for others to take ethical initiatives when threats and challenges are facing an industry. Let me turn to a case that I was personally involved in, as Luis uh, mentioned, Blood Diamonds. My job was to chair the 42 countries that participated in the global rough diamond trade when the Kimberley process came into effect. This story is primarily about the ethical values of peace and security. It has an important message for ATTA, for the ATTA sustainability revolution, because of the role of business in shaping a new ethical supply chain in the diamond business. Probably the most emblematic case of business and violence is the role of blood diamonds in the Civil War of Sierra Leone. This war lasted 10 years, from 1991 to 2002. It devastated the country and created terrible regional instability. The Sierra Leone conflict required massive international intervention to unwind the conflict. To describe the horrific nature of this war, I'd like to read an excerpt from the findings of the report of the Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The commission finds that children were specifically targeted during the conflict. In particular, the commission finds statistical patterns that are consistent with the hypothesis that children between the ages of 10 and 14 were specifically targeted for forced recruitment, rape, and sexual slavery. 25% of the victims reported to the commission across these three violations were young children, 11 years of age or younger in respect of forced recruitment, 13 years or below in respect of those raped, 12 years or younger in respect of those forced into sexual slavery. This was a new kind of war in which the levels of violence and human rights abuse far surpassed any possible political objectives. And yet, the conflict, the catastrophe, burned without stop. What could have been fueling it? The Security Council, through the expert panel on Sierra Leone, found in the year 2000 that it was the sale of diamonds into the international marketplace through the Liberia of Charles Taylor that was the primary source of revenue for uh, the conflict, for uh, the rebels that were terrorizing the population. Estimates go up to about $150 million per year of financing through diamonds for uh, the, uh, the rebels in Sierra Leone. An appalling policy contradiction existed at the heart of the international system. The diamond supply chain permitted the financing of the conflict at the same time as the United Nations, the same countries buying the diamonds were mounting massive UN peace support operations. UN sanctions were ignored, and the diamonds found their way into an international marketplace and onto wedding rings that couldn't tell the difference between blood diamonds and legitimate diamonds. The market was ethically blind. As a result, there were calls for a system to ban blood diamonds from the world market and protect the legitimate diamond trade. The KP was hugely progressive for its time. It took blood diamonds out of the legitimate market by requiring that all international trade in rough diamonds be uh, certified by governments as conflict-free. It put an ethical peace and security factor into the global marketplace. 
The West African, African conflicts wound down and the war's end brought a new emphasis on transitional justice, truth and reconciliation. War criminals like Charles Taylor were prosecuted and imprisoned by the International Criminal Court. The Kimberley process happened because of what I call the magic triangle. When business, NGOs, and government work together. In this, sense, in this case, there was a key set of like-minded governments led by South Africa. In the first instance, the chairman was Abiy Chikani. Dedicated NGOs like Global Witness and Partnership Africa Canada, plus businesses like De Beers, who got together to launch a diplomatic process. It was initiated at the site of the first modern diamond mine in Kimberley, South Africa. South Africa sensed the threat because the easiest way to stop conflict diamonds, to stop blood diamonds from reaching international markets would be to stop African diamonds from reaching international markets. And that would have been disastrous for South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. NGOs provided ethical pressure and consumer awareness. And De Beers needed its business to survive. When you're looking to create a revolutionary change for good in a system, you need a revolutionary vanguard. We needed it in the Kimberley process because there were serious reactionaries and countries who benefited from non-transparent trading practices, smuggling, and collusion with illicit, uh, illicit actors in the trade. In your industry, there may be those who profit from low standards and want to keep it that way. Let's unpack some of the diplomatic tactics that instigated this revolution for good within the diamond industry. I think they'd be relevant to ATTA if it chooses to instigate revolutions for good in its industry. Choose your like-minded partners and start with a cohesive small group. Otherwise, you'll be condemned to standards that fall to the level of the lowest common denominator. Create safe spaces to identify and talk about the uncomfortable problems the free riders, and the poor performers in the industry. Maintain a laser-like focus on integrity and credibility when you're talking about standards. You want participants to reach for the top, not race to the bottom, and you might need to kick people out. It is fundamental that an individual be selected as leader. It doesn't have to be a permanent leader, but a person needs to be the leader supported by followers with a shared commitment to the revolutionary vision. Now, what do diamonds have to do with the tourism business? You're probably asking yourself by now. Diamonds and your product have something fundamental in common. Their value is primarily emotional and psychological. Diamonds are symbols of purity and love. Diamonds are forever, like our marriages. Your adventure travelers are expecting an authentic experience that is in line with their values, and they're looking for memories that will last a lifetime unsullied by ethical shortfalls. Now let's take a look at how a leading company, Tiffany, has moved beyond the conflict frontier to the sustainability revolution to add deeper value to the brand at the ethical level. This is the page of Tiffany's uh, uh, sustainability, uh, web, uh, their website sustainability page, and it shows value for the brand, value for the consumer, value for the suppliers, and values for the stakeholders. It's, ethic, it's active ethical brand management through systematic sustainability through the entire supply, supply chain. Look at the components. Collaboration across industry and NGOs. High and defined standards requirements for responsible suppliers, even human rights and conservation activism. To make these things happen, to generate positive collaborative change in your international environment, in your international market, this also takes diplomacy. After 30 years in the tough, demanding, sometimes cruel, often disappointing world of international relations, I'm asked, I asked myself, did I learn anything? Did I learn anything from my mentors? Did I learn anything from my mistakes? Did I learn anything from the things I saw? How can I explain to others how this ancient profession, second oldest profession perhaps, works in our modern world? 
Well, I found that there are specific professional skills and qualities to practicing diplomacy. And as ambassadors for adventure tourism, they won't be a surprise to you, I don't think. Building trust, managing personal security, humility and authenticity, supporting the good guys, doing the right thing. And there's another one. I'll come to that later. I hope you bear with me if I share some of my personal diplomatic experiences that lead me to these conclusions. I'm using examples from some extreme situations, Mogadishu, Somalia, Kandahar, Palestine. But their relevance in extreme situations validates their universal application, I think, uh, as well. Entonces, para mis amigos argentinos, eso va a ser un poco como relatos salvajes. One of my jobs was to open Canada's direct diplomatic relations with Yasser Arafat and his Palestinian government in 1998. When one works in a situation of conflict, suspicion is generalized and trust can be a very scarce commodity. Canada had recently completed a free trade agreement with uh, Israel, and we wanted one, we needed one, with the Palestinians uh, too, in the context of our support for the peace process at that, uh, at that time. Uh, before we had our office uh, in Palestine, it was our Canadian embassy in Tel Aviv, Israel, that was responsible for Palestinian relations and for negotiating the trade deal. And they couldn't close the deal. They tried and tried and tried and tried meetings, 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 and uh, they couldn't get to they couldn't get to yes. Um, but once we all opened our diplomatic office in the Palestinian territories, we had some meetings. We worked on the negotiations, and all of a sudden they said, OK, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make a deal with you. Um, and it was on the same terms as before. I was very puzzled. I couldn't figure it out. So I asked one of their negotiators, what, what happened? And she said, uh, well, Tim, what happened is uh, we talked about the Canadian negotiating team. Uh, we, we talked about what kind of people you were. Uh, and then we, we decided you understood our aspirations. And you understood the relationship between this trade deal and our aspirations. And then we realized you weren't trying to screw us. And we could uh, make a deal. They didn't trust us until we understood their aspirations. Now, trust is a very high order of human relationship. And I think mutual understanding of aspirations is a key part of it. I'd also say that consistency of conduct and unfailing honesty, never lie, are also important components to uh, building trust. And perhaps the most important of all is the way you value human relationships. And I think for those of you uh, working in the Middle East now, uh, you know, while we're waiting for conditions for tourism growth to resume, those of you who are being loyal being constant, being present, and caring will find yourself with huge assets of trust when the time for growth resumes. When we get to, pick, to positions of influence or power, we attract flattery, and our ego can often get overinflated. This is a terrible occupational hazard when you're an ambassador. Everyone calls you excellency, even when your fly is open. And the risk is when you confuse your position with your personal qualities. It would be the same in the tourism supply chain. Outbound operators can have enormous influence and power over destinations. And power is seductive. And we can mistakenly think that the adulation of others equals our own superiority. Power and influence should always be managed with humility and responsibility. One thing that is a total universal value is abhorrence of arrogance. I've seen that everywhere. It's immediately smellable, and it can poison relationships. And of course, at the same time, it's always important to conduct yourself in a way that brings credit to the job you're doing and credit to your team. I think probably another thing that diplomacy and your business has in common is a craving for adventure that can sometimes sneak past our better judgment. In 1992, I went with colleagues to Mogadishu, Somalia, before the peace-seeking mission to talk to the warlords. 
uh, like Mohammed Farah Idid, who you may remember from Black Hawk Down, about uh, political conditions there, because we were about to send a big Canadian uh, peacekeeping uh, mission. Well, uh, in his house, where we somehow got to by hitching rides with uh, NGOs, he said, no, Canada, don't come, don't bring your army. I told him we would anyway, uh, and then hoped we'd get out of there. Um, it's true we needed to know what they were thinking, but we didn't need that bad. We got caught in a firefight trying to leave and had a hell of a time finally getting out on a Red Cross plane. It was stupid. I learned, and so did my institution, that when you're working in civilians in Afghanistan, in this case, make sure you understand the risks and have protection that corresponds to the threats. Our world is not getting safer. And it is crucially important to manage risks with seriousness and the best and freshest intelligence. Your embassies are your friends in this, and you should know them. There is nothing more important to an embassy. I speak from Canadian experience, but I know it's the same with everybody else, whether it's Peru, United States, China, or Britain. Nothing is more important than the welfare of their citizens. You know, the uh, NATO mission in Afghanistan was not just about beating the Taliban. Generals told me, you know, killing more Taliban is not going to solve our problem. It was about helping the Afghans to build a civilian government that would provide basic services to the population. The good guys who took risks for peace and development of their country were those who stepped up to the plate to take the jobs as mayors, as provincial, provincial legislatures, and district administrators. In our reconstruction work in Kandahar, and Louise mentioned I was the rock, but I was also heading a uh, combined civilian military team, combined American-Canadian team uh, for reconstruction in the province of Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. Our job was to help these guys to bring education to kids, provide health care to people, and agricultural services to the average Afghans for economic reconstruction. But this story doesn't have a happy ending. The Taliban realized that it is much easier to kill a soft civilian target than a hard, hard target, a NATO soldier. And all these men that we worked with and more were assassinated because governance became the strategic battlefield in Afghanistan. It's critical to identify the good guys when you're trying to achieve a revolution for good, when you're seeking change, and to support them but also it's crucial to recognize the risks they may be taking to generate change in the place where they live. This is me in the central prison of Kandahar, Afghanistan, checking on the conditions of prisoners. One of our jobs was to make sure that when Canada took prisoners on the battlefield and transferred them to Afghans, they were not tortured. I'm sure some of you remember the unfortunate stories about Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay and uh, how uh, damaging, damaging that was. So we developed a program of uh, anti-torture prisoner monitoring and we were responsible for that as uh, civilians. So we went into the, pr to the prisons, talked to the Canadian captured detainee uh, prisoners and talked to them on a regular basis to see if they were okay. It was very interesting, but I don't recommend this as an adventure tourism product. You know, nobody else much cared about the dignity of the adversary. The fact that we did the right thing and checked to make sure our Taliban detainees were treated with dignity, could see their family, is one of the most lasting things. When I asked Afghans, what will we remember about Canada when we left? They said, we'll remember that you went and you checked on your prisoners, because everybody had someone in jail in the family in that situation of uh, conflict. We'll remember that you did the right thing when it came to torture of prisoners. So my diplomatic tips to the ambassadors of ATTA are build trust, stay safe, be humble, support the good guys, and choose to do the right thing, even if it's hard. In conclusion, I'd like to turn now to what might be starting points for ATTA to instigate its own revolutions for good from its standpoint in the travel and tourism industry. Your product is a precious one. 
How can you use the power of your market? How can you use the power of the cohesion of your organization to drive revolution for good in the massive global tourism aid industry? Your clients want authentic experiences that are ethical and in tune with today's values about human rights and are anticipating tomorrow's expectations. The three primary ingredients for your revolutions are the ethics and values of your clients, your ability to shape the policies and practices of your destinations through your expectations and your choices, and your allies in the magic triangle. To generate real change requires collaboration between business, government, and civil society when they work together. Remember the case of diamonds. It's the emotional value that's key. Thinking citizens, we see this across so many sectors, thinking citizens want to participate in ethical supply chains. They want to be responsible about the impacts their purchases generate. And your revolution can create mutual value, tangible and intangible for you, for adventure travels, travelers, and for your destinations. So here are my ideas for revolutionary starting points for the collective power of the ATTA membership. The world is facing accelerating loss of biodiversity. We all know this, and I'm sure it was a big discussion in your uh, WWF uh, uh, section. And adventure tourism has a proud record in supporting conservation. And it could start instigating a revolution for good in protecting biodiversity in strategic destinations. Starting points would be identifying specifically what the threats to biodiversity in your destinations are. Maybe choose a couple strategic ones first. No who is defending the environment and explore potential commercial partnerships with biodiversity defenders. Look for governmental or multilateral allies like the Convention on Biological Diversity. You know, we're all coming, we all know. Climate change is above all a moral issue about our behavior and about our duty to coming generations. A starting point would be to talk to your suppliers about their ideas for a shift to low carbon energy and define association expectations for low carbon adventure offerings. And by the way, big, all the big multinational oil companies are thinking and working on their own energy shift and reducing their emissions and carbon footprint. They may be dinosaurs, but they are smart ones and they are rich ones, and they want to evolve and survive. Governments know they need to reduce emissions, but they need innovative businesses to come up with the ideas. There's great room for creative partnerships in the travel industry with energy companies. And your destinations and your suppliers and governments would be very, very supportive. ATTA could be in the vanguard here. Human rights and the ATTA, what's the connection? LGBTI rights are finally recognized as human rights by the UN and by many countries, but not all. Companies in your business need to understand the issues and the destinations you market and ensure your clients have the information they need to make ethical product choices. I bet there's room for dialogue with gay rights groups in your destinations. You know, boycotts would not be effective and they may be counter effective and, and make social conflict around this more acute. The starting point could be how to use the promise and benefits of adventure tourism to push for rights protection and recognition. Tell your problem partners that their rights policies limit the access to markets where these rights are respected. You know, little could be more important than securing the rights of indigenous people, especially in our continent, America. The vitality and dynamism of indigenous people. That's the headline. But also, there are many indigenous cultures that are at risk of extinction. Right now, there's a historic moment. A combination of indigenous peoples claiming their rights, international recognition of those rights, and governments creating the laws and policies to move from rights to results for indigenous people. After some 25 years of slow, torturous, difficult negotiations. In 2007, the United Nations finally approved the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And there's a central concept called free prior informed consent. 
in this declaration. And also, it's gaining traction in national policies and industry policies uh, in the extractive sector, particularly. This means free prior informed consent. That means indigenous com communities are informed, can discuss, and can decide, according to their traditional institutional mechanisms, in advance about things that can affect them culturally, socially, economically, and spiritually. If you're working, or if you want to work in areas with indigenous peoples, you should be structuring a dialogue with them on the basis of their internationally recognized rights. And you may be interested to know that the International Commission on Mining and Minerals and Metals, it brings together the leading mining companies in the world, accepts free prior informed consent as an obligation. The potential alliance between ATTA and the first peoples of this world is huge. And I know you have uh, representatives here, and this is a big topic of discussion, a main theme for, uh, for Saturday. And I believe that ATTA could be in the vanguard of companies that enter into respectful, mutually beneficial relationships with First Peoples, bringing them new development opportunities according to their aspirations through sustainable tourism. And there's another point I'd like to mention here. I do uh, work uh, on the extractive sector and human rights in uh, Latin America, and there's a wave of social protest. There's a wave of dissatisfaction. And this includes many indigenous uh, national associations and uh, communities. And if you don't make this revolution, it may come to you in ways that are uncomfortable. So a final word. At this conference, you know, it's abundantly evident to me that ATTA is reaching the maturity, the scale, and the international presence where you can project your ethics to create change in international systems and international markets. There's an opportunity for ATTA to take a diplomatic role and leadership position to instigate revolutions for good that you define. This could be done by collectively taking an ethical supply chain approach to your business and forging partnerships in the magic triangle between business, government, and NGOs. And what's more, based on the cohesion and like-mindedness of your association, ATTA initiative could lead and influence the mainstream tourism sector more broadly. As Shannon said in his introduction to this conference, summit delegates are the revolutionaries by choosing the ethical route over the financial, financially expedient route. Oh, and there is one last lesson I learned uh, a as a diplomat, and that is uh, we were posted, uh, Natasha remembered, and one of her favorite uh, postings was Ethiopia. It was a tough one for me. And when it was time to go, I was ready to go. Uh, but, uh, so anyway, we were, uh, we were leaving. Uh, I was going to the airport, and as I was walking uh, to the gate, uh, a person I had worked with, a, a good contact, came up to me and said, oh, where are you going, Tim? I said, oh, I I'm finished. I'm going back to Canada. He looked at me with shock and sadness. And he said, you didn't say goodbye. And you know, we all know that you never get a second chance to make a good first impression, but people really remember you by the way you say goodbye. Thank you very much.